Mr. Hervey, um, I noticed from your little biography here that you were you were born in New Orleans. When did your family move north? Uh, my father moved north in. I was born in 1922, so he came here in 22. He worked in the post office in New Orleans, and uh, he found out that he could be transferred if he could get here. So he uh, he hopped one of those uh, work trains that they were looking for workers for the railroad, and he probably would have ended up in uh, where does the railroad stop? Somewhere in Minnesota. Hmm. Rock Island? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, by the time he got to uh, Illinois, he was freezing to death, so he got off. And uh, so I was born in New Orleans. My sister and brother were born in Chicago. I see. I see. Um, were you in junior college when the, when the war began? I had finished. You had finished. Yeah. I see. What were your What were you uh, What were you doing when when World War II began? Well, in 40, 41, uh, they had the civilian pilot training program, and uh, we had one uh, flying pro uh, flying operator, black operator who applied for contract, and he got the contract. So uh, we were trained, we were trained in the primary and the secondary phases under the CPT program. And uh, I had my license uh, in 41. <laughs> By the, when, when the war started, December. I didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. <laughs> but um, everybody was going. And, uh, we had to go in and take the Air Corps exam to see if we could if we could pass the exam. Then they let us finish the course. Was was there an a an active effort to recruit you, or was it pretty much you on your own initiative doing this? Well. The experiment had been announced, and of course the, uh, the the people that were running the CPT program were aware of it. And as, as a matter of fact, they told us, they said that, now you make up your mind that if you finish this class, you may have to join the Air Corps. And of course we went down and took the exam. There were 13 of us, and out of the 13, 13 passed. We had then nowhere to go because the, the quarter that they had allowed for Tuskegee was so small that uh, I, had, I passed the exam in 40, early 41, I mean late 41, and I didn't go into the Air Corps until 43. Hmm. So in the interim there, I took a job as a as a chauffeur for a salesman, which was an excellent experience because we left Chicago in June and went from Chicago to South, uh, let's see, we went to Chicago to St. Louis, Corpus Christi, Texas, all the way back through down to Tampa up to New York and back, 13 weeks. It was quite an experience. And I, that's when I found out what really what segregation was. Because, uh, I, I hadn't been in the South since I was born, but I found out what it was like. Mm. Yeah. Well, it was really a shock to you then? Yeah, so mm. I had some pretty uh, shaky things that happened on that trip. But um, he was a salesman, a white fellow. Yes, he was. Yeah. He was uh, he was a Russian Jew who had uh, come over here 
his father had brought him over here during World War I. And uh, he was much, very much aware of what was going on over in Europe. And he, I got a history lesson every day. Hmm. So then, when you when you went to Tuskegee, it was not a it was not a shock to you as to what the South was no was I, like. I was I was well into uh, what the problems were there. Mm -hmm. okay. um, why don't you tell me a little bit about that about that trip? You said you had some pretty what, hairy experiences as you were. Oh, you mean the, the, yeah, the children trip? Well, mainly. It was, well, I, I, I became aware of where, what the problems were going to be when I went up to Evanston, Illinois, to pick him up and uh, went to his hotel and they said, well, I'll call up and see and if he wants to talk to you. <laughs> and he said, Herbie, I'm not quite ready yet. Go out and get something to eat and uh, be back here in a half hour and then we'll be ready to go. So I walked out of the hotel and saw a restaurant and walked in and they put me in the kitchen. In Evanston? In Evanston, Illinois. So when I told him about that, he said, well, you got your feet wet, it's going to be that way from now on. So what I would do was drop him off at his hotel and then I would have to check with the the bellman or somebody where you know where do I go and he'd say well you go over so and so and miss so and so she takes in uh, Pullman porters and traveling salesmen that sort of thing you know and it was uh, it was interesting how uh, easily some people get used to things, but it was very difficult for me. We had a situation when we got to Biloxi. It was on a weekend, and it was nothing but Navy. And he didn't have a reservation. He couldn't get a reservation. So he got on the phone and called the lady that had a resort house out on the beach. She said, sure, come on out. We'll take care of you for the night. So on the way out, he said, look, he said, uh, we're going in. She's going to fix us dinner. We'll get up and come back here and get back on the road. Now, all you have to do is don't say anything. I told her you were Filipino. <laughs> I said, what? He said, just do what I tell you. So we drive up to the house and who opens the door but the maid? And I didn't say anything. I, I tried not to make eye contact, but it was too late. <laughs> so we went in, sat down, had dinner, went upstairs, and I had a room, and the next morning we got up and took off. Halfway back, he says, I left my glasses. He weighed about 300 pounds. He said, I'm not going to ride back there. He said, drop me off here and I can do some paperwork and go get my glasses. I said, Saul, I don't speak English. He said, what the hell, you got your meal, you got your bed, go get the bed. <laughs> <laughs> so I go back, ring the bell, and I said, Mr. Brown forgot his glasses. I knew it. <laughs> you going to get killed? Boy, you going to get killed. <laughs> Seriously, saying that? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so we had another experience when we got to Macon, Georgia. I dropped him off, and they had one street where they had the Black Theater, a restaurant, and a hotel, and some stores, and right across the street was the Greyhound bus station. So there was a lot of traffic there, people going. And I went into the restaurant, had dinner, and then I went to the theater. And all of a sudden, the lights came up, and the MPs came in. They said, uh, all, all soldiers from Fort Camp Gordon, all out in the trucks. And 
most of them were soldiers. They got up in the other set camp. I forget what the other one was. You fought out. And the rest of it were just civilians. Then the city police came in. So I want all you niggas to get out of here, go directly home, and don't stop for anything. And as we came out, the crowd across the street in front of the bus station was like a mob. Well, I just had to go down the street to the hotel, and I went in and you know, I'm not sure what, what was, what's going on. It seemed as though a black sailor, a soldier, gotten drunk, and the uh, police tried to stop him. He grabbed the gun and shot one of them. So naturally, there was posses being formed, and everybody over seven years old had a stick or something in his hand, and uh, it was really very scary. <laughs> So I called him at the hotel. He says, well, where are you? I said, I'm in the hotel. He said, well, they're not going to come in there after you. And you can't come over here. So just be cool. <laughs> well, I sat up all night watching, seeing what happened. And the next morning, they had a, the Army had a jeep with a 50 caliber machine gun on every corner in the town. And people got up and went, started going, going back mm. and forth, you know. We had determined uh, on the way to Macon that once we crossed over into uh, Alabama, we were going to have to get gas stamps, the 13 states along the coast there had ration gas. And we had some get stamps, but we didn't have enough take us down to Tampa. So I said, well, you know what? We had a, a, a brand new 1942 Plymouth. It had a huge trunk in it. Well, I said, I don't know if, if, if a 55-gallon drum will fit in that t that truck back there, but if it does, we can attach a petcock to the gas line and we'll have 55 gallons of gas. He said, hey, that'll work. He said, okay, go out and get it done. So I drove to a gas, I mean a garage, and I walked in and I learned how to approach and I went in and I said, I'm the driver for a salesman. This is his car. And he wants to know if you know anyone who's smart enough to put a tank uh, in the truck and connect it so that we can... The guy looks. He says, yeah, we can do it. Who's going to pay for it? I said, he's going to pay for it. He said, all right. So they got the tank and they hooked it up and uh, I went back to get the car and I was sitting waiting for them to bring the car out. And some guy came out and said, hey nigga, I jumped up, he said, not you, <laughs> he's talking to somebody else over there. I said, I'm going to get killed down here because mm -hmm. every time somebody uses that word I get, mm -hmm. you know. Well anyway, it worked. We were able to go all the way down to Tampa. And uh, we came back through the, uh, we got into the Virginia, West Virginia. That was interesting. We stopped somewhere up in the mountains for some gas. And people came running out. They were looking at two things. One, they were looking at me, because they hadn't seen any blacks. The other, they were looking at that car with the thing over the, the, the hoods over the lights. They had never seen <laughs> These are things that stick in your mind yeah. when you But anyway, by the time I got back, I had, uh, I had a, uh, a good feeling about what it was like being in the South. 
in Birmingham, Birmingham, I think, it was, yeah, in Birmingham, I, there for a weekend, and I decided to go to the show to see Gone with the Wind. And I knew what the, the arrangement was, but I walked up to get the ticket, and I thought they would tell me to go around to the back door that took you up there. He said, go in, and you had to wait in line until the other show let out. And as I looked around, I didn't see another brother. I said, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> so I went back to one of the ushers. I said, where's the manager? He said, uh, his office is over there. I said, I want to see him. And I went in and I explained to him. He says, well, I'm sorry. He said, uh, we don't, uh, blacks don't come in on, on certain days. <laughs> so that was that. Uh, oh, I'm Catholic, so I asked the lady I was staying with on Sunday morning, I said, where's the nearest Catholic church? And she says, you know, the nearest one is right two blocks away, but I don't think that's your church. I said, that doesn't make any difference. Church is church. So it was 12 o'clock, which is the, the last mass, and as I approached, the usher stopped me and she said, he said, your church is over on such and such a street. I said, I don't have time to get over there before mass. That's not my problem. You can't come in here. So I walked around and went over to the priest's house and waited until the priest came out with his altar boys. And I told him what the problem was. He says, come on with me. So we went in and came out behind the sacristy and he sat me down in the front seat and went through the mass and as he left he called me back and went in his office and then he started lecturing about uh, you know i understand you don't understand but you have to realize and i said wait a minute i said, yeah. i have i have this mass all the time i've been on this trip and you're telling me that now i gotta go looking for a uh, church in order to go to mass i said i don't have time to be bothered with that i'll just skip it he said well that's that's up to you you know, you know what the rules are. <laughs> so when I got, let's see, I went to Tuskegee in March. Of 43? 43. <coughs> so the first <coughs> Sunday, I went up to the TAC, TAC officer and I said, uh, I was looking at the, the uh, list of services, but I don't see anything for Catholics. And he says, well, I don't, I don't know any Catholics that I'll find out. So he came back and he said, no, they don't, they don't have enough for a priest to come out here. He said, but uh, there'll be a six by six and a driver to take you into Tuskegee. And uh, the driver will uh, get you there and bring you back. Well, the driver says, uh, I don't have to be back until six o'clock. So you can do what you want until then. So I had all day on campus <laughs> on Sunday. When I got, they wouldn't let the, the, the new cadets couldn't get off the campus unless it was an emergency. So you uh, were actually housed in the campus facilities when you were trained to Tuskegee? No, no, we were at the air base, at which the air is base. about 12, 12 miles away from Tuskegee Institute. So when the guys found out that I got off the base and spent all day on campus. Next time we had a bus, a truckload, and after that we had two trucks. Oh, suddenly converted. <laughs> converted. <laughs> <laughs> I should have got a medal for that. <laughs> you were mentioning last night that that your instructors here at Tuskegee were white. Yeah. Um, what, what did you think of the instruction and the instructors there? I thought the instructors, the instruction, let's put it that way, was, I found no fault with that. But uh, here again, I'm sure that anybody that goes into flight training, the instructor is going to say, you dumb son of a bitch, blah, blah, blah. But when they say, you black son of a bitch. And that's what they use? That's, that's, that's made the difference. Yeah. That made the difference. And uh, some did and some didn't. Now, when I got to 
But I got the basic. All the tra all the trainees were going in the single engine, but that's when, they, when my class came along, they decided to split it for single and twin engine. And uh, they put me in twin engine, which teed me off. I was ready to quit. And my instructor at that time was a young Jewish fellow from uh, New York. And I told him, I said, look, I didn't come in here to be a bus driver. I, wanna... I said, is there anything you can do? He said, no, there's nothing I can do. He said, well, I want to talk to you. So I said, you come on with me. And we got in a plane and we flew off to a little auxiliary field. And we sat under the wing and he told me some things about what he had been going through down there being Jewish. And he says, uh, Herbie, if you're ever going to be anything worth anything to yourself, you have to learn how to accept these things and make the best of it. Giving up is not going to be the answer. And I, I'll never forget. And he wasn't much older than I was. And so I went on, and uh, it, it made me realize that uh, I had to get my attitude together. One of my roommates was a guy from Alabama, and big, tall, dark guy. And he could yassa and nosa the way they liked it, you know. And, uh, most of us from Detroit and Chicago, and uh, we, we didn't cotton to that very easily. You know. That's what I was curious about. Um, the cadets must have been from all over the country. They were. Uh, what, what did you learn from these other people? You say you... Um, was, was this a real important experience for you to, to talk to? All black men from all over the country? Well, it was important to me for this reason, and that is that uh, I had only been to junior college in Chicago. Most of these guys were graduates from the major black colleges, and they knew what college life was. They knew, uh, you know, to say that you could walk into the president's office and have a conference with him just amazed me. I had no idea what black life was on, on, on campus. And they had fraternities, they had their own uh, uh, sports group, they had uh, uh, athletes that were well known. So it, it was like me meeting a new part of your existence. I found out that there was uh, a black society in Atlanta, in uh, Boston, in Virginia, and I mean it's organized, and <laughs> and uh, uh, they were all primarily educational based. If you didn't go to college, you didn't count. So there was a hierarchy then, absolutely, in the black community. Very much a hierarchy, which I had, I had not been introduced to. And this wasn't at all the same in Chicago, in any. Not to that extent, no, because there, the the hierarchy in Chicago was based on a, a different uh, parameters. It was how successful are you in your job? And a school teacher and a Pullman porter were top. And there were some of the guys that I knew that went away to school went to Howard, went to West Virginia State, went to Hampton. You know. But generally, the working class were looking for civil service jobs. And that, that, that's what we thought was uh, success. What kinds of things, uh, I know this is a very broad question, vague question, what kinds of things did the cadets talk about? Um, was there, was there a lot of talk about segregation, discrimination, this kind of thing uh, that you remember? Or well, there was, there was always the, the <coughs> undertow of, of, of fighting with these instructors. And, and there was real Each instructor there. had five students. <coughs> and uh, he was expected to graduate at least two, maybe three. So the other two 
were fighting for survival. And at the end of the day, we would get together and critique the day, you know, what, what did he jump on you about? And, you know, what was he, you know, what were you doing? And in this way, I believe, and there may be some other factors involved because of this twin engine training program that was coming along, but we had the largest graduating class at that point out of Tuskegee. I think we took in 52 and graduated 47 when they were bringing in 30 and 40 and graduating uh, 15 and 20. But as I said, I think that had a lot to do with it, the, the change in the, the twin engine program. They needed more. So. But uh, we were very, those of us that were in school were very concerned about what was happening to the 99th that was overseas. Uh, we were primarily concerned about what was, you know, where we were going from here. The segregation thing was something that, as long as you were on the base, you didn't have a problem. It's when you got off the base. If you decided to get off the base and come to Chicago, the minute you got to Montgomery to get on the train, then you had your problem because they didn't recognize you uh, in those cadet uniforms. They were an angry about it. And, uh, that was, was one of my questions. What, what was the reaction of whites? Oh, they, were, they were very uh, unfriendly, hmm. very unfriendly. Did they make comments or, or yell at you or anything like that? or Were you taunted because of no, you? No, I wouldn't say they went to that extent. but. Uh, <coughs> Of course, you had to. Uh, you have, you realize that once you you were in the segregated part of the train, because the trains were segregated then. You know. So here you're among friends, and you have good treatment. But uh, the minute you got to Evansville or wherever they make the change, then you moved into the white car uh, compartments. By then, that's when you had to deal with those people. I was curious, too, as what you, what you did uh, when you were off duty. Did you go into the town? Did you did you travel? Um, and then the reaction of whites in the South to, to um, officer candidates who were, who were black. Well, the white military, in many cases, refused to honor the, the fact that we had officers, bars, or wings. They wouldn't salute. And it d depended on where you were. If you were walking down the street in Montgomery and a white soldier came by and didn't salute, you could call him down, but what could you do? But if you're on a base, that's different. See? Uh, you picked your time to try and uh, use your influence. It, uh, It was always questionable about what we were going to run into. I remember what my instructor said, I'm going to make a stop over at another training field. And he got out of the plane and uh, went in to talk to one of his buddies that was based there. And I was sitting down next to another cadet, and we just started talking about, well, how are you making out, you know? And, and it's rough. We were both in basic training, you know. And we had no problem. He was white. He was white, mm -hmm. and we, we were fighting. The, bi the big problem was that airplane. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I found that usually pilots don't give you uh, a problem once they recognize that you're doing the same thing they are. But that doesn't always work because I, when I was in, at Godman, we had a call from uh, Fort Knox, had a nurse, white nurse, who had an emergency, uh, had a death in the family. So they called over and asked if we could drop her off at Dayton. So they put her on my ship, and we flew into Dayton, and I called in and asked for a 
of transportation. And as we drove up to the operations office, <coughs> the whole place was you know, guys filling out their forms and everything. It just got quiet. And she shook hands and said, thank you for the help, and went her way. And I'm filling out my paper, and they're just staring. Nobody said, hello, how are you? Now, these are guys that had been overseas and were flying wounded back. And that, that was their first stop of date. They, they didn't know that there were blacks in, uh, in the Air Corps. So it was, we went, we went down to uh, an air base in California where they were training night fighters. They were flying at P-61 with Black Widow. And you had no, they, they turned on no runway lights and all of the doors had little red lights outside and you walked in a cubicle, closed that door and then you could open the other, you know. Well, we had run in some bad weather and there were two ships, so that's six, six people on each ship. And when we walked in, they just, my God, they're coming to take our job. What the hell are you talking about? Then one of the fellows said, well, you know, they have already told us that you guys see better in the dark than anybody, so. <laughs> <laughs> and they believed it. <laughs> they believed it, yeah. Was your training uh, dangerous? I mean, did were the... No, I wasn't. I, don't think, I think we all, during the time I was in the uh, flying training, we lost one guy in, um, in my class. Now, once they got up into the combat training, then it got a little more dangerous. But I don't recall any of it. They had a couple of accidents on the field. Uh, one guy flew into a bridge at night. But uh, ordinarily, I wouldn't say it was that. The fact that they train so many pilots, mm -hmm. you know, you have a certain amount of accidents. But uh, our training was very good. It was very good. And, uh, I think. I think one of the reasons that we were as successful as we were was that they didn't have any place for us to go. So we got more time flying time than the average pilot. The average pilot, when he finished his uh, uh, combat uh, training in whatever plane it was, he had 60 flying hours, and he's on his way to overseas. We flew around for weeks and months. And I had, by the time the 477 was ready to go to combat, I had over 800 hours flying that airplane mm. because I had been flying it for two years. Now explain that. You said because you had no... You had nowhere to go. What, what, so well, what do you mean by that specifically? The bomber group started from scratch, and I was in the first class. When I finished the, the uh, uh, B-25 transition school, the, the bomber unit was at Selfish Field, Michigan, and that's where it was going to start. And they, they had five airplanes, and they had to build a bomber group, which is four squadrons, 16 planes each, two crews to a plane, six men to a crew. So here are 26 guys and five airplanes up there in March of 44. And we weren't ready to go until May of 45. And all that time, you were flying. we were flying and flying. And, uh, we, would, we would take the guys who had just come out of school. Now, they started, they sent the first ones out to this transition school. But after a while, the minute they graduated from Tuskegee, they sent them to us and we trained our own co-pilots. We became their instructors. In, uh, in formation flying and things right. of this kind? That's right. right. Were, were conditions in, in, so you were based in Michigan? 
we were based in Michigan for uh, about three months. Mm -hmm. Then we got into this hassle with the officers club, and they shipped us down to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Would you? Um, I, I might be telling that about that last night. Would you? Would you put it on tape for me, please? There's an officers club on every base, and the Army regulation says that it's for the use of all the signed officers or transits. They did not want us in the officers club, so they designated the training unit, which was everybody that was there training to become a member of the 477th or the 332nd because they still had some fighter trainers that were, uh, were just designated as trainees. And therefore, they their, uh, their officer's club was such and such a building. So we fought that and said, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And uh, they went into the officer's club anyway, and then they put a military guard out there, and uh, they got some auth authorization to build a separate club for us. And that's when we got on the horn and called Washington and called the Pittsburgh Courier and the Daily New I mean, the Chicago Defender. And they decided to move us, since, since this was in Detroit, right after the time they had the riots. They decided to better get us out of there. In 43, they had the riots, so right. I remember. Yeah. Right. And we were there in 44. So they moved us down to uh, Godman Field. And we had a, there's an air base right next to the, the uh, tank base there. What field was that? Godman. Godman. Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. It's at Fort Knox. So we trained at Godman. And we had our own club because there was nobody else on it. The white officers didn't stay on our base. They stayed over on Fort Knox. So they went to the Fort Knox club, and we had our own club until the unit started getting too large. We had, I guess we had two squadrons there. And by the time they were, were ready to make it a four squadron, they moved us up to Freeman Field, which is Seymour, Indiana, which was a larger base. Okay, the same thing happened there. Well, the first thing that happened was that uh, uh, the women started saying that they couldn't go in town and try on a dress or a hat or anything. And so your wife was with you? Or you My wife you was with me, yeah. And uh, so we said, well, we'll have to have a word with the mayor. And we pointed out to him that the payroll on this base is a million dollars a month. And this was in what town again? Seymour, Indiana. Seymour. And make up your mind, we're going to spend this money either in St. Louis or Louisville or, or Detroit or Chicago or wherever. And uh, they decided that they could make some changes, which they did. But the situation came up about this officer's club again. And they designated certain buildings as trainee buildings, of which the officers club was not one. And they put this order out where you were supposed to read and sign that you read, have read and understood that you will not, you will only go into these certain buildings. Well, these people uh, were the first ones that got the order and they refused. So then they hmm put them under arrest. Yeah. So they were essentially confined to quarters? They actually flew them off the base and sent them back to Godman Field. Hmm. And, uh, and they turned Godman Field into a... Uh, they didn't have uh, barbed wire around it, but I mean they were confined to their barracks over there. Officers. That's when the, they brought General Davis back from uh, Europe, and he came in to Godman and took over the 477, and getting them ready to go over to uh, Pacific.
your wife pretty much travel with you wherever wherever you were stationed? Yeah, she did, but that's, that's one of the reasons I got out, because she was not enamored with the military at all. She was That was not her style, and there's no way that you can progress in the military if your wife is anti. She's got to be behind mm -hmm. you at all times, so I decided that I would... Uh, get out and go back to school and try and learn something. Another story that was very interesting, we had one fellow who was from uh, Pocatello, Pocatello, Idaho. And he says that there were three families in Idaho, no, there were four families in Idaho. He had met three of them. When they put up the exam for the Air Corps, he and all the other friends from school went and took it. And they all passed it. And they went somewhere, and he came to Tuskegee. Well, you talk about culture shock. Mm. He had never seen that many blacks in his life. He didn't understand the body language. He didn't understand the idioms. He didn't. Understand. He was just like being a brand new country. Mm -hmm. So that was something that he had to come through, and uh, he learned fast. So <laughs> he, mm -hmm. he he became one of the raunchiest ones of all. <laughs> once he <laughs> well, did, did you have much contact with with white officers when you were? Wait, was your unit that much contained? Uh, and, and separated from white units. Yeah. What, what, what even even the 99th, which was the pursuit first squadron that went into combat, they were attached to a white unit, but they were sitting over on another base by themselves. And uh, the fellows tell me that no one ever came over and offered any help. Uh, they said the the, the most interesting thing ever happened was when a white officer came over to their base and sat down and just talked to them about what it was like up there. And he said they learned more in eight hours than they had the whole time mm. they'd been overseas. Mm. But they had no one in the unit to, to tell them, so they would all read it out of books. And, you know, it's a lot of difference. Who was your squadron commander? General, well, at that time, it was Colonel B.O. Davis, Jr. I didn't didn't realize that he was a, that he was a flyer somehow. B.O. Davis was a West Point graduate, and his intention was to become a pilot, and he thought he was, he was in West Point in 35, when he graduated in 36, but he asked for a pilot training. And they said, his, his thing. I wish you could see that film that I have, because I have one that brings all of this out. But he was the first black to graduate from West Point in 47 years. And the reason, there were other blacks that went, but they were put on the silent treatment. Because we had three or four guys in, in our group that had been to West Point for six months, a year, or maybe. But uh, they couldn't hack it. But Davis hacked it for four years. None of his classmates ever spoke to him. So when you <laughs> when you put all that together, you can you can understand that he was determined that this was going to work. Now, this is the first class, first five that graduated, and he was one of them. Did you, uh, as you were going through, did you ever regret that you had gone into the military and that you had, that you had left home? No, no, no. I was, I was hooked on flying. Uh, and anything that 
had to do with flying was what I was primary. I used to play the violin. I gave that up. I gave up everything because this was the thing that I wanted to do. And uh, my father had been in the Navy in World War I. I had an uncle who uh, spent about 14 years in the Navy. And I would have gone that way, probably, except for the fact that the war broke out and uh, the Navy wasn't taking any blacks, you know. And then I got the CPT program, so that was the only way for me. Do you have any close calls when you were flying? Uh, like sand formation flying could be pretty dangerous. <laughs> uh, I had a few, which um, none of which uh, resulted in anything uh, serious. But uh, one incident I remember I was I had a new co-pilot and we had our full load of uh, we had practice bombs that weighed 100 pounds each so we had uh, uh, 12 practice bombs and our crew and then some of the fellows were being transferred from Gottman over to Freeman. So we took about three passengers in the back. And went to take off. Well, his job is to run the flats down. Was it by hand? No, no, it's, uh, it's, it's hydraulic. Mm -hmm. it's supposed to run the flats down and then run them back up. And then uh, I tell him how many degrees flat I want. Well, with, with all of this weight on, I didn't want but half flats. Well, the runway that we were taking off took off right over Fort Knox, where the gold is. So there was a we're heading right toward Fort Knox. Well, there we go. We're going down the runway, and I realize I'm trying to pull the stick back, and I'm getting no reaction. And I glance down, and I see he's got full flaps on. Well, by this time, we're just getting, barely getting off the ground, and he realized what was happening. He reached for the flap handle, and I had to grab his handle, because if he had pulled up the flaps at that time, we would have sunk, and we'd have gold all over us. <laughs> So all we could do was just struggle out and just barely get over that uh, Fort Knox until we got enough altitude to gradually suck the flats up and uh, gain airspeed, you know. That's one thing. And another thing, there was a period that I think in about one week, uh, my wife was not on the base. She was home having daughter. No, she was back in Chicago? No, she was in um, Providence, Rhode Island. No, it wasn't a daughter, it was a son, I forget. Anyway, so I'm on the base and whenever the, the maintenance department had a ship that was finished, they had somebody had to come down and check it out, you know. So I was volunteered to do I didn't have anything else to do. So for about three three days out of a week, one day I took off and the uh, strap on my parachute evidently got caught in the the hook for the escape hatch. And just as we got off the ground, shoot, there goes the escape hatch. <laughs> you know, didn't hit the tail, thank goodness. Another trip was... Uh, we got out and I heard this noise and there's nobody in the back now, it's just pilot, co-pilot and the engineer. And I heard this noise and I said, in, go back and to the engineer, go back and see what's the, the going on back there. The life raft was bouncing around on a, on a rope <laughs> out there. Those sort of things. And the third one was, yeah, I think I, I got the main wheels down but couldn't get the nose wheel down. Now they do have a crank where you can go in and crank that down. 
So after about three episodes like that, I said, look, get somebody else. I'm going to rest a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, uh, did you have pretty much the same crew the whole time? Or? After, uh, after I got my own ship assigned to me, then I had my own crew. Right. I had, uh, they stayed with me until, until the, we got out. What's the relationship like, you know, in a crew? You said there were six people in the B-25? Right. Pilot, co-pilot, and the navigator. They're pretty much a family. And then the, the other enlisted men. Uh, in some cases, it was very tight. In others, it, it depended on, uh, you know, uh, one of the fellows in my crew never got up on Sunday. He stayed in the bed and read all the newspapers and books, you know, so he wasn't any fun. <laughs> uh, but the, the engineer and the tail gunner were from St. Louis. I kept up with them for two or three years after the war and then I, I don't know what happened to them. The radio gunner, who was the youngest guy on the crew, uh, was from Boston, and we had more problems with Hector, Francis I. Hector, call him Fuzzy, because he was always getting into trouble doing something, you know, and, uh, but he and I became very close friends. He was one of the uh, background supporters of the uh, New England chapter of Tuskegee Airmen. He's been president. He came out and became a, uh, he worked for a distillery salesman. So he's, he's one of my good buddies. Did you, uh, you say you didn't want to go into the bombers. Did you, uh, did you end up thinking it was, it was not so bad after all? Well, uh, I didn't see any opportunity to do anything else. You wanted to be a fighter pilot, did that mean? However, now, when, when the war was over, they and they were downgrading. They took two of the bomber squadrons and one of the fighter squadrons and put them together and made a composite group, which meant that uh, for about a year, I guess, they operated that way, and then they made them a fighter group again, and the bomber guys had to go in for uh, fighter training, and they did. And of course, the uh, many of the, the single engine guys, when they came back, they went into the twin engine training, and some of them became instructors. You know. Did you did you develop a fondness for your airplane? Oh no, we had we had the uh, B twenty five J model, which was brand new at the time that we got it. It was the first one that had 15 guns on it. They had uh, already uh, determined that it, it, its usefulness was not as a medium bomber anymore. It was more as a uh, attack bomber. Hmm. And when they told us we were going to the Pacific, they said, well, you don't need the Norton bomb site anymore because you're going to go in skip bombing and dive bombing and uh, strafing and that sort of thing. So they, they had four guns on the side that the pilot could fire. Where, where were they? Where were they located? On the fuselage? On the, the fuselage. fuselage. Yeah. <coughs> the navigator had uh, 50 caliber in the nose. The engineer had a turret, twin turret, on the top. The radio gunner had one on each side, and he went back and forth too. And the tail gunner had twin. So that was the hottest thing going at that time. Hmm. Yeah, certainly, I think they found that the four-engine bomb, the heavy bombers, were probably more useful, weren't they? The heavier bomb loads. And oh yeah, they were. They were the big. They could carry the biggest load. Here it is. Here. Those are the two on each side, two here and two on the other side. 
And there's two in this turret, two in the back turret. Mm -hmm. And the transfer uh, the well, there's a window. Anyway, there's, there's a window. Oh, yeah. And the radio operator, he fires from this window or the other window on the other side. Yeah. I want to be sure and take down a notation about this book. I don't think we have it in our library. Well, if you... I'm sure we don't. Well, I can... I can have one mailed to you. Okay, and I'll pay you for it. Well, let's see. Um, you've been talking about you know, problems that you had in the military and, and you know, with whites and, uh, and instructors and all the rest. Um, did, you, did you have a concept of the enemy, you know, the Japanese, the, the Germans? Um, Did you, did you wonder what you were fighting for, if you were fighting them? I'm, I'm putting this very clumsily. Uh, oh, I did you wonder why, why black people were fighting in this war? Because of the kinds of things you'd gone, you'd gone through at home. Well, we recognized that uh, this was the only way that we were going to be able to prove that we were as good as anybody else. Uh, at that time, you couldn't do it on the baseball. You couldn't do it in football. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do it in the corporate office. So this was the first chance that our generation had to prove. And although there had been foot soldiers in all the wars, this was this was technology, and this was uh, this would prove that uh, you had a mind that was able to function as well as anybody. And uh, after the war was over, uh, things began to change rapidly. And uh, I'm sure that uh, the attitude, uh, once they integrated the the Air Force, uh, the attitudes changed almost overnight. You had some hard-nosed guys that just would not accept it, but uh, when I got out, I joined the reserves at O'Hare. And uh, the first two-week tour we did up there, we did it in that, old, that big hangar the way they used to build the, uh, the uh, C-54s. Had 3,000 reservists in, on cots in that hangar. And they were from Michigan, in, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois. I don't know if they came from Minnesota or not. But uh, within two weeks' time, we had established for them that we were as good pilots and sometimes better than they, and they accepted this. And, uh, by the time uh, they were ready to send that, it was a troop carrier unit. They were ready to send it overseas. Uh, most of the black fellows who had come out to see what was going on uh, either decided they didn't want to stay and got out. The ones that stayed, uh, they were ready to go. Did you, uh, did you feel that yours was a special responsibility? In other words, it was not only um, uh, fulfilling your own desires as a, as a pilot, as an officer, but that you um, had a responsibility to other black people you know, to, to show that, that, that you were as good as anybody else. I mean, did, did you feel that kind of responsibility that you were representing oh, well, a always bunch do. of people? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it comes from the need. They, they've always, mother, dad, grandmother, aunt, whoever, 
you've got to be better in order to make them. Uh, my uncle used to say there are enough half-assed white people out there that they have to deal with. They don't have to deal with any half-assed black people. <laughs> so, yes, we had a you had a responsibility to yourself to to get above the pack because most black people are poor and uneducated. So I mean, you do it personally for yourself, then you uh, you you realize that now you've got a responsibility to show everybody else that you're as good as they are. Uh, it's it's something that's going to always be there. I don't think that there's ever going to be a time when a black person can say, well, I got it made, I don't have to worry, you know, I'm, I'm a good old boy like the rest of them. That's mm -hmm. not true. Not true. Uh, there's always that feeling that I don't care how close you get, the, uh, there's a respect up to a point, and it can be cut off at any time. Hmm. You've never permanently made it. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Right. Now, there are, there are exceptions to everything. I, I know some, uh, I know some people who have uh, friends that they have considered like brothers and sisters because that's just the way they, mm -hmm. they regard each other. And I don't, uh, I don't try to categorize everybody into any one category. One of the newspaper, you know, the television uh, people at uh, Truax last week asked me, what, what do you think about the sex issue in the military? So I said, well, are you asking me personally or are you asking what does the Tuskegee Airmen think about it? Because if you are asking the Tuskegee Airmen, if you'd asked this question back in 1943, they'd have said, hell no. I think that was the only answer. I said, but now we have to realize they were saying, do you want blacks in the Air Force? And they were saying, hell no. So we have to take an attitude that the military can work this thing out and it, it'll work. What um, what effects do you think your military service had on you as a man? Do you think it had a positive impact, a negative impact? I, I personally think it is very positive for me. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of other fellows have different attitudes, but I think generally the, the, uh, the fellows who uh, consider themselves as uh, originers, originators of the idea that blacks are as good as anybody else and proved it, they think that this was the best thing that ever happened. And uh, they've just used this uh, experience through their lives to build on and now they're proving in other ways that uh, they can do anything if you put your mind to it. All you have to do is get the opportunity, and uh, it'll work. Do you think that there are, did the <coughs> military service have any negative influences any, that, you can, that you can think of? In other words, anything that you regret uh, from those, those years in the military? Mm. Not, not that I can pinpoint. I, I, once I decided that uh, I was going to go back to school, I just about uh, realized that my main interest was not in the military, it was in flying. 
because I tried to get into the airlines. And uh, here again, uh, we're starting from square one. When I went, when I went down to the Stevens Hotel to answer an ad, there were 800 ex Air Force pilots there, and they lectured for about two hours. And they said, "Now go to lunch, and you come back, and you got a four-hour exam to take." And I walked up to the guy and said, look, I'm not concerned about your exam, but if I pass it, do I get a job? He said, are you covered? I said, yes. He said, no. So uh, it was as simple as that. And uh, that was in 46. And the first black pilot didn't get hired until in the 50s. Finally, uh, United sent word that uh, they would consider any person who uh, could meet certain qualifications. And the one qualification we couldn't meet was under 35 years old, because all of us were, mm -hmm. were over by that time. You know. I often hear, uh, for example, students. We have oh, not too many black students on campus, um, but you know, numbers. And they, they certainly suffer discrimination, there's no question about it. Um, but do you think, in your lifetime, things have improved? Um, well, superficially, I mean, when you go back to white and colored water fountains, and you can't eat here, and you can't go to that hotel, and you can't, yes, uh, but, you know, all that does is uh, make it possible for you to spend your money <laughs> uh, where everybody else spends theirs, but that's that's not a hell of an accomplishment. That's, that's just writing a, a, a negative that has been asinine in the first place. But you still have to do whatever is necessary to get on the dean's list and to uh, join the groups that you want to join and uh, get into the type of work that you want to do. And it's, it's, it's still problems. It's, whether they want to admit it or not, there's still a quota system. And I don't, uh, I would say this that I believe that it is, I think it is possible that in some instances integration has destroyed the initiative of some blacks because they, uh, they accept the attitude, well, uh, I don't have to try any harder than anybody else, and that's not true. Mm. So I think it's lulled them to cut up a sense of false security. Uh, that's right. Hmm. right. I've never heard that feeling expressed before. Well, I, I think if you ever paid a trip to any of the black colleges and listened to the way uh, they're motivating their students, they're telling them, uh, your education is just as good as anybody else's, but you've got to get out there and do a better job. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot to be said about the uh, the way these public school systems have allowed the integration process to destroy the uh, standards of the school. And uh, in a city like Chicago, where you have an, a school district that's as large as Minneapolis, and it's all black, and the caliber of students they're putting out is not up to par. Mm. And there's another 
school district that is Hispanic, and there's another school district that's white. And there are differences in each of them. And uh, I, I think until we recognize that our workforce is going to be made up of not white males, it's going to be made up of females and minorities, uh, the techniques have to change. They have to change.